All right, number one, why are arrays considered to be fast and linked lists considered to be slow? Something along the lines of arrays exist in contiguous memory and therefore the buckets, the bucket locations can be calculated. Calculated. Linked lists are not contiguous, therefore one must traverse the list to arrive at a bucket. Something along those lines. All right, questions on that one. Two, what is the advantage of a doubly linked list versus a singly linked list? A uh, couple different things you could have said. Uh, first thing is uh, um, easy access to the end of the list. Also, every node knows about the next node and previous node. So traversing the list is more convenient and often faster. Something in that ballpark. All right, uh, three, how much space in memory does a 20 bucket int array take? Well, an int is 32 bits or four bytes. So we need 20 of those. So 20 of those is going to be 80 bytes or what, 640 bits. Okay. Uh, some of you got partial credit if you, uh, um, if you just wrote an answer. I couldn't give you any partial credit because you gave me the wrong answer. But if you uh, give me some work and, for instance, a lot of people had um, ints being 16 bits. So then they said something like 16 times 20 and you came up with the wrong number. But you, the only, your math was right. You just messed up that. Uh, let's see. Um, well, I think Alex, didn't you have some gigantic number you gave me? Yeah, he showed me the math, but oh my gosh. How much, how, what did you say the size of an int was? I think 2 billion, right? You used the 2 billion number? Yeah, it's plus or minus 2 billion is the range. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Sam, did you do yours in scientific notation? I, I multiplied the by Oh, yeah, makes sense. Yeah. In my networking class uh, this semester, right? Uh, there was a question on there that dealt with the total uh, bandwidth for streaming a uncompressed video over like an hour at a certain bit rate and all this other crap. And um, one of the students, he got the answer right, but I didn't specify the, uh, um, you know, what, to, what format to give me the answer in. So, you know, I was thinking, you know, maybe total gigabytes or maybe terabytes. It was like 0.33 terabytes was the answer. He gave it to me in bits. <laughs> so, so I got a scientific notation answer. It was right, but it was, uh, it was your cousin. Of course it was. It was Ali. <laughs> of course it was. See from Palestine too? See? Seriously. I was thinking the same thing. I wasn't going to say it. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. Okay, four. All right, questions on that one? Make good sense for the number of bytes, blah, blah, blah. Four, what are the three methods that the stack must support and what does each one do? We have push, pop, peak. What did you write for yours, Trey? Paul, yeah, that's weird. <laughs> um, so I took off full credit on that one. Yeah, um, on the actually the entire exam for something like that. Uh, so push, add something to the top of the stack. Pop, remove something from the top of the stack. Peek. Look at the top without removing it. 
And not that I asked, but it is a LIFO Q, Austin. Yeah. <laughs> you was right. I just wrote it. Austin decided to tell me the type of Q it was, and he got the entire question right, except he, he answered a part of the question I never asked incorrectly. <laughs> what do you call FIFO? Huh? Yeah, FIFO. Actually, put FIFA, so I don't know. Because <laughs> it was to say, it's pronounced FIFA. FIFA, not FIFA. You're the Frisbee golf guy. You got a, a Frisbee soccer guy, right? So I assume you, uh, what? What is it, Ultimate Frisbee? It's basically Frisbee soccer. <laughs> so, but you don't watch soccer? Really? Yeah, it takes so long. It's not as bad as cricket. So what about NASCAR? Huh? What about NASCAR? Well, NASCAR is an excuse to drink. It's different. <laughs> it's a whole different type of event. <laughs> yeah. You sit there and you drink for three hours waiting for crashes. Okay? And then when you get to like the final three laps, you start paying attention if you're sober enough. That's, <laughs> that's NASCAR. Right? <laughs> I actually think that is a very accurate description of, of, of NASCAR. We all love crashes. We don't want anybody to die, but lots of flame. And Oh, we love the ones when the guy gets out in his flame retardant suit and he's actually on fire. And they have to put him out. Oh, I love those. I love those. So good. Um, all right, so Push Pop Peak. So that one should have been easy. So if you missed that one, uh, suck less. Uh, let's see. Write an error-free hello world. Program. Program. So, you might say something like public class. Hello. Public static void main string array args. Not string args array, Alex. Isn't it funny how much I remember about individual exams? I created these a while ago. Uh, string array args. Were you a C++ programmer? Uh, that's what I started with. Okay, yeah. C++ is the other way. So something along those lines. Public class hello. So this is, this is what makes it a program. This is just a method. Okay. Public static void main, string array arc, system dot dot println, hello world, all the semicolons and everything in the right places. All right. Questions on that one? Okay, six, write a patient record class with fields for first name and last name, an appropriate constructor, appropriate getters, and a method for uh, which would, a method which would allow system that out to Printland to display the patient with their first name followed by a space followed by their last name outside of the patient record class. I'm not sure if anybody got that part right. So uh, we're going to say class, patient record. And this guy's going to have two fields, so private string f name, private string l name. Oh, I love how that uh, is auto correcting for me. Okay, a appropriate constructor. So I was looking for you to show me that you know how uh, that constructors need to be the same name as the class name. And then appropriate getters, because these are private variables. So public string get f name. And public string 
get L name. All right, so something along those lines. Patient record class. We have our first name and last name for our fields. An appropriate constructor. Here's our getters. Now the last part was to include a method that could be used outside of this class with the println method to display the first name followed by a space followed by a last name. And that is public string to string. So I was testing to see if you remembered about the two string method. And this guy should return this dot f name concatenate with a space, concatenate with this dot L name. All right, so that's number six. Make sense? Questions about that one? I don't think anybody in here got this one right, got this part right. Why is that? Oh, I got you. You read the question poorly. Yeah, like reading back over when I read over it just, like, just now, I realized that I never read outside of the patient record class. Oh, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, that was the exact same way I interpreted yeah. it. Yeah. It was because I just did like a public void. And when so. you said when you said the uh, and a method which would allow system dot out dot to display the patient, I thought that was just oh he wants a a CISO statement in the display method. But now, I'm saying, I'm saying. CISO? System. System. Well, because when you type it in Java, you can type CISO and then control space and it'll auto change it to the full statement. Oh, really? I didn't know that. That's Eclipse? Eclipse will do that for you? Is that like something that's built into Eclipse or like did you come up with the weird acronym? <laughs> no, that's, that's built in there. All right. So I've never heard that before. CISO? say-so statement. All right, so in any case, that's number six. Number seven, write a method called compare patients that takes two patient record objects from question number six as parameters. Your method should return true if the two patients are the same in terms of their contents and false otherwise. So we're writing a method you could, uh, did I say make a class method? Just a method. Okay, just a method. So it's going to return a Boolean, true or false, right? And we're going to call it what? Compare patients? Compare patients. This guy's going to take in a patient record P1 and a patient record P2. So two patient records. And we can return p1.getFname dot equals p1 or p2 dot get f name and p1 dot get l name dot equals p2 dot get l name. So we're going to compare the we'll get the first guys first name by calling the getter that you wrote. Then we'll call the equals method from the string class because this is a string, right? And we don't compare strings using double equal sign that compares pointers. That's primitive type equivalence operator. So we use the dot equals method of the string class to compare it to the first name of the second patient record. If that is true and, if that is true and, I'll elevate this a little bit. We get the last name of our first patient and compare it to the last name of our second patient. If both of those are true, this will return true. A couple people did testing for null. Where you check to make sure P1 and P2 actually held patient records. That's fine. You didn't have to do that. You could have always said throws exception. 
and then just did try to do this. Well, actually, we don't even need to try it. We can just say throws exception. There we go. Now it'll still work even if there's an error. All right, questions on that one? And you could have done the whole if statement rigmarole if you wanted to, you know, if the first name is equal to the last name um, and the uh, uh, last name or first name is equal to the other first name and the last name is equal to the other last name, then return true, else return false. You could have done that too. But this is probably the shortest way of writing it. Okay. I think one person maybe, maybe wrote a compare method inside here and then called p1.compare p2. So they actually wrote the logic inside number six, which was fine. Um, a lot of people uh, were calling the um, compare to method from the string class, which uh, we introduced when we were lexicographically comparing strings for alphabetical order, for sorting strings. That guy actually returns an int, not a boolean. It returns a zero if they're the same, lexicographically. Something less than zero if the first one should come before the second one, and something greater than zero if the second one should come before the first one. So uh, I think several people use compare to, and I don't think anybody used it correctly. And I'm not sure what threw you off there. Was it because you were writing a method called compare? That you just assumed equals was... To, didn't you use compare to? No. Really? Did you get it right? I got it close. I just didn't use dot equals. I, I didn't equal equal. Well, that's not close. What's that close? Well, I, I was talking to him about it after the exam. I was like, should we use dot equals? Yeah. Who used compare to? Why? Uh, well, I used it in my interest exam. They said, like, if compare to, like, if it's equal equal to. Okay, well, so did you use the dot compare to method or did you say equal equal? Okay, which wrong answer did you go with? <laughs> so you use dot compare to, but you treated it as if it returned a Boolean, right? Uh, Not an int. And what's temp one and temp two? That's uh, that's the patient those records. Are the strings combined. Yeah, those are the strings. Oh, let me let me let me see. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. If he if he did that, I want to say maybe he was actually comparing patient records instead of the strings. Well, if you got the add arguments, that would. Okay. Yeah, you didn't take the. Uh, you didn't take the parameters, but let's look at PR one. Temp one, temp two. If one combine is that because it's checking it within the if statement if it's true or false. Yeah, I see. Yeah, you call compare to a little funny. You didn't use the parameter list, but you did notice the logic worked right. I'll give you an extra point back. Two extra points? Yes. You didn't take any parameters. It says, yeah, so minus five. Wait, how many points was it worth? Twelve points, so it's eight points, right, total. Okay, so you wrote a method. It returns the right thing. You took no parameters. You just decided to create your own parameters. Um, okay, we'll assume these guys work. Gets... Um, all right, so if we assume we're going to knock you four points for not taking in parameters, then we're going to not knock you for this, which means we're that this stuff is all legitimate. I'll give you, I'll, you want two points back? That's what you want? 
All right, I'll give you two points back. Shoot me an email reminding me. All right. Um, what was I talking about? Okay. So in any case, uh, this is all compare patients needed to be. Something along those lines. Questions about that? Eight. Write a method called replace vowels that takes a string as a parameter. Um, oh, wait a minute. I already told you I give you two points back. There were, there were 12 points for that one. Ah, whatever. It's fine. As long as you realize you were stupid for not taking parameters. Do you realize that? All right. <laughs> all right, write a method called replace vowels. It takes a string as a parameter that returns a new string with all the vowels in the original string replaced with question marks. Uh, okay, so we're going to return a string called replace vowels. It's going to take a string as a parameter. We're probably going to create our... Right, let me just kick this down a bunch. We'll create a string maybe called map that has A-E-I-O-U, A-E-I-O-U. Has all the vowels in it. We'll say for int i is equal to zero. i is less than s dot length i plus plus. We're going to need to build a new string. So string answers starts off as the empty string maybe. Then we'll ask the question if map dot index of s dot char at i. So we're looking at the current character in s seeing if we find it inside of map. If it is in map So if it's not equal to a negative one, that means we found it somewhere in map. Then what are we going to do? We're going to say answer is equal to answer concatenated with a question mark. So we're not going to take that vowel. Instead, we're going to replace it with a question mark. Otherwise, answer is equal to answer concatenated with s dot char at i. And in the end, return answer. Replace vowels. Takes a string as a parameter. It's going to return a string. We have a string containing all of our vowels. Another string to contain our answer that we're going to build up because strings are read only, not uh, read write. Randy, didn't you use a? Didn't you try to write the char at method? Who did that? Somebody wrote to the char app method. One way street. Now you can't say s dot char at i is equal to a question mark. You can't do that. You've got to build a new string. Strings are read only. Because this guy boils down to a character over here. S dot char at i, let's just say that that's a, one of the vowels. That's an a. So what you're trying to do is actually redefine an A to be a question mark. Okay, not in this world. All right, so we have our string that has all our vowels in it. We have our string we're going to use to build up our answer. We're going to loop, have our normal loop that loops through every character in S. Each time through, we'll ask, is the current character found inside map? That is, is the current character I'm looking at a vowel? That's what this asks right there. Okay, is it a vowel? Meaning, was it found inside of that string? If it was, I'm going to replace it in my answer with a question mark. Otherwise, I'll just keep whatever I found because it was not a vowel. Do that till we're done with the string. Ultimately, return our answer. All right, questions on that one. Okay, uh, so that is the exam. Uh, like I said, as a whole, we did all right. Uh, the average was almost a low B, like a high, a high C. Reasonable enough. Who knows? Maybe it'll be a low B now with uh, Randy's extra points. Never know. <laughs> all 
All right, so if, uh, after class, I'm going to talk about some new stuff now, but after class, if you think I uh, screwed you out of points, uh, come up and um, you can haggle. Uh, if you think I gave you too many points, let me know, and uh, I'll take some away. Give them to Randy. <laughs> You'll take them, right? Yeah, so <laughs> whatever, whatever points, whatever points you want. All right, so there's the solution to the exam. Okay, let's go here. <laughs> Man, we're missing a lot of slides here, are we? All right, what, what was the last thing we did? We were doing Towers of Hanoi. Did we write that? Yeah. We got, Q. Huh? Q. Okay, then we did Q. Do we have a homework assignment on Q? Did I solve it? Yeah. Oh, and then I wrote the I did a video that solved it, right? Okay. So we've done stacks, we've done Q, so we're ready for something new. That sound legit? All right, good. Huh? A well, new data structure. I mean, queues, stacks, basically just linked lists, right? We've dealt with we've dealt with with linear data structures long enough. Now we need to get into some hard stuff, right? This crap is too easy, right? <laughs> this piece is just not the piece of cake. Are you coming with us to uh to Raleigh? Did you? All right, so you're gonna come? I think that'd be cool. Oh, but you, you don't you don't drink though, do you? They have they have really fattening food. You'll you'll like that. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah yeah okay. Uh, what am I talking about? Oh, I need to check something here real quick. Open. To be honest, I don't know. Officially, I'm going to say if you're not 21, you're not allowed to drink. <laughs> That's my official Concordia position as your professor. Well, I can't stay up 24 hours. I'm too old to <laughs> fall asleep. So, uh, keynote. So, what they do with these here? The plan is, I think, uh, the 17th, April 17th in the morning. Is that Friday? Yeah, that's that's Friday. a Friday. So. Awesome. So, like, 10 a.m. Ish. Class. Yeah, but it's no, it's, it's no different like a sports team that has to miss class on a Friday for baseball. Sports. Well, you know what I mean. It's the, <laughs> we'll you know. Huh? We'll, we'll get you for it, right? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. We'll, we'll. It'll be officially excused from uh, Dr. Cario. Uh, so we'll leave probably around 10 a.m. I say we, not me, you. Well, <laughs> my, hey, I have to rough it. My flight leaves like at 5 in the morning on Saturday. I'm going to have to wake up a little bit early. So the guy who's going to drive me to the airport, what's up? <laughs> yeah, seriously, it's going to be crazy. If you leave at 5, that means you have to be there at least by 4, at least at yeah. 3.30. Yeah, uh, not that early in Milwaukee. It leaves Milwaukee. Oh. I could just walk in. <laughs> it's not going to be a problem. Yeah, but so anyways, they'll leave on the 17th, probably around 9 or 10 a.m. Um, with the plan being, it's probably going to be a 17 or 18 hour drive. That's with stops and stuff like that. You know, because you want to be at the hackathon the next day as close to 10 or 10.30 as you can. Um, so just kind of... You know. uh, then the hackathon ends at 5 p.m. on Saturday. No, I'm sorry, 5 p.m. on Sunday. So then you guys would start driving with no sleep. Any idea what would be up with drivers? Uh, well, you probably are going to want to sometime near the, I mean, the, you actually stop coding around 1, uh, 1 p.m. And then the rest of it's like presentations and preparation for presentations and stuff like that. So... 
At that point, there'll be time for naps. So whoever's going to be your first shift driver should probably start sleeping. Um, and then, <laughs> and then the, uh, um, and that's per car is what I'm, what I'm getting at. So uh, yeah, and then whoever's going to be the second shift should definitely be sleeping. You know, while the first shift guy's driving, so it'll be problem solving for the full three days. <laughs> so, well, I think it's if you just don't stop. It's like 15 hours. That's if you have unlimited gas. How much is a plane ticket? Plane ticket is, uh, I think it was about 400 bucks. Round trip. So, and if you, well, that's if you, you do the flight I took, which is in the morning, and I think one of the planes might be full now. So, you might, that might not even be an option. Might have to go up the night before. Um, or you could drive to Chicago, maybe, and do a direct, direct flight. And maybe that's, you know, four or five hundred. Who knows? But you'll miss the camaraderie of traveling in a cars with your classmates. Yeah, as fun as that would be, it's also like two hours. <laughs> well, following by following twenty four hours of coding, and then seventeen hours back. Yeah, so you really gotta. It's the it's the whole experience. Okay, so really, it's it's you know, let's call it. 36 hours in a car over a three-day period with 24 hours of programming in the middle. It's reasonable. Phenomenal. <laughs> Won't that be an awesome experience? On a budget pleaser? <laughs> I mean, you can drop four or five hundred bucks on a plane ticket if you want. But uh, we'll get you there by car. <laughs> You see, that's the students. They can sleep in cars and stuff. I, I, even when I travel, I have to like bring my whole like bed with me. I have like a, 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 a Tempur Pedic four inch topper that I like stuff into a suitcase for a twin bed. I bring that with me, and I bring my own pillow of back problems. I mean, I, it's, no, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna bring it to this thing because I'm not. I'm not staying in a hotel or anything, you know. You, you're not going to be, that would look really stupid. If I'm setting up like a tempur bed and on the cement floor of this hackathon, people just come by and spit on you. They want you roughing it. So I'll sleep on cement or actually I'll find a couch. I'll find a couch in there. That'll be, when you're that tired, you can sleep. <laughs> uh, all right. So let's start talking about trees. Alex, are you coming with us? Uh, I think my plans to. Like, really, I want to. Huh? I want to. I'm thinking about it. <laughs> well, if you're thinking about it, sign up before the tickets are gone. Imagine you do it now. It's a good plan. They keep running out of tickets. It I takes. Know, it's just like. It takes. Driving. Well, you don't have to drive. You can sleep most of the time. Let somebody else drive. Yeah, but then I feel bad for not driving. Just tell me you have diarrhea. <laughs> <laughs> or pay for gas. I think the department's going to try to pay for as much of the gas as they can. We're going to do the best we can given the, the final situation to keep the cost to an absolute minimum for the students. Ah, you should come sign up. Just, just, just suck it up. <laughs> just like me. <laughs> I'm already concerned about the. I almost went up the night before to stay in a hotel. I didn't want to get up so early, but another uh, person's going with me and they didn't want to stay in a hotel. So. Uh, okay, so linear data structures is what we've been talking about up to this point. So this is one node attached to another node in a line, i.e. linear. Okay, and we use these guys to store lists of things, okay? So linear data structures allow us to have a collection of something. Uh, and we can sort the collection and things like that, hold it in a certain order, but the collection doesn't have structure other than that, okay? So really a linear data structure is a replacement 
for an array with a smaller memory footprint, okay, with a more reasonable memory footprint. Uh, and also an efficiency footprint that you don't have to recreate um, the array every single time you want to add something to it. All right, so that's our linear data structure. Now, when we get to nonlinear data structures, first one we're going to look at is a tree data structure. Okay, now trees come in a lot of different forms. You have the uh, what, can, can, conifers. Is that one of the trees? That's another kind of tree. Is that it? I haven't had like tree stuff since like like seventh grade or something. All right, so all right, so initially a tree is going to be a root node with zero or more child nodes. Okay, this would be a generic tree or something we might call an enary tree. Okay, an enary tree is a root node with zero or more child nodes. What we're going to look at initially is something called a binary tree. Binary tree is a root node with zero, one, or two child nodes. Where every node to the left of a root node is less than or equal to that root node, and every child to the right of that root node is greater than that root node. All right, so I'm going to give you a picture of that here in a second rather than just a wall of text. But the idea is, is that now that we have a nonlinear data structure, the structure itself gives some meaning to the data rather than just the nodes. As far as right now goes, when we've been dealing with our linear data structures, each node has all the data we need to know about it contained within it, right? So let's look at an example of a tree. And there we go, that's a binary tree. It's a root node followed by zero, one, or two child nodes. This happens to just be the zero. So this would be a simple tree, a tree with just a root node. Now, we're going to add another node to this tree. We're going to add a 5. When we go to add the 5 to this tree, this is a binary tree. It has to follow those binary tree rules. Should the, is the 5 less than or equal to the 1, or is it greater than the 1? It's just a simple math, people. 5 bigger than 1, right? Okay, so it's going to go to the right of this guy. Here, I'm going to spread it out a little bit. All right. Now we're going to add another node. We're going to add a 7. Is the 7 less than or equal to 1 or greater than 1? Greater than 1. Is the 7 less than or equal to 5 or greater than 5? Greater than 5. Place that there. Okay, now we're going to add a 1. Is a 1 less than or equal to 1 or is it greater than 1? Less than or equal to... We have no child here, so we'll just place them. Here, I'm going to actually adjust our tree a little bit just to give me some wiggle room for new values. Everything else would have happened the way it happened. So I'm going to do a 2. Is a 2 less than or equal to 3? Yes. Is a 2 less than or equal to 1 or greater than 1? Greater than 1. So it's going to go there. So as we're inserting stuff into our tree, as we're inserting stuff into our tree, we add it to the root node, and then it kind of falls through the tree and ultimately lands in the correct place. All right, that makes sense? So this is my current tree in this example. Now, if you notice, we can walk this tree in a certain way to get our numbers in order. When we just look at it at a glance, like, okay, this is just, a, a, just random numbers, correct? These are just random numbers. Well, there are different ways to traverse a tree. 
we can do an in order traversal. And I'll come and add that here in a second. We can do a post order traversal. So in order traversal of this tree is going to start at the root node and we're going to visit them in order. So we're going to first go to the three, then we'll visit his left node, which is a one, then we'll visit his left node, which doesn't exist, then we'll visit his right node, which is a two, then we'll visit his left node doesn't exist, we'll visit his right node doesn't exist, we pop back up, we pop back up, now we're going to visit three's right node, which is a five. Visit his left node, doesn't exist. Visit his right node, and we have that. So that's an in-order traversal of our tree, where we visit the node first, then we visit the left child. Okay? Post-order says we're going to visit the children first, and then visit the, uh, uh, well, I say we're going to visit the children first. We're actually visiting the left node first, then the root node, then the right node. Okay, so let's look at that for this example. So we're going to visit three first. Well, and when we start at three, we're not going to visit this guy yet. We're going to go here to one. We're going to visit one's left node. Doesn't exist. Now we're going to visit one. Then we're going to visit his right node, which is two. Uh, well, actually, we're going to visit his right node. We're going to try to visit the left node, doesn't exist. Then we actually visit the, the two. Then we try to visit the right node, doesn't exist. We're done. We bounce back up, bounce back up. Now we actually, well, we visited the two. Let me just start over so I do this in the right order. I'm going to say um, visit when we actually read the value. All right. We start here. We go to his left node. We go to his left node, doesn't exist. Now we visit this guy. That's our one. We go to the right node. We go to the left node, doesn't exist. Now we visit the two. We go to his right node, doesn't exist. Already visited, already visited, now we visit the three. We go to the right node. We visit his left node, doesn't exist. Uh, we look at his left node, doesn't exist. Now we visit the five. Then we look at his right node, we look at that guy's left node, doesn't exist, visit the seven. Look at his right node, doesn't exist, we visited, we visited, we visited, we're done. So post-ordal traversal, notice that our numbers are in order. One, two, three, five, seven. That makes sense? Okay. So let's build a tree. What are the components of a tree? Well, our binary tree data structure is going to have a root node. Okay, so we'll start with just that. Then we're going to have our node. What's a node? Well, a node is a value, or a payload, if we use the same verbiage from linked lists, a left node, and a right node. Okay? So that's all the stuff that goes into a node, at least initially. So we can start building out our skeleton for our binary tree. Oh, in the networking class, we're writing uh, our own replacement here on campus for uh, sharing files between dorms. Like instead of BitTorrent, we're writing our own version of that to bypass the network routers. It's a good class. All right. 
So we'll create a new project. We'll call this guy CSC 300 Spring 2015 Binary Tree. <clears throat> We'll create a new class and we'll go ahead and do our driver. All right, so there's our driver. Then we're going to create another class and we're going to call this guy a node. And we decided a node. And we're going to do this as integers, just like we did before. Private int payload. And then we have a private node. Left node. Private node. Right node. And we have to have our constructor here for our node. So public node is going to take in an int payload. This dot payload is equal to payload. This dot left node is equal to null, this dot right node is equal to null. All right, pretty similar to what we had for linked lists, except we just don't have a next node and previous node, now we have to have a left and right node to maintain this structure. All right, then we're gonna wanna get getters for our payload and getters and setters for our node, our uh, um, left and right node. So I'll go to source, generate getters and setters, and we want both for left node, both for right node, and for payload, we just want to get. All right, so there's node. Then we'll go ahead and we're going to create our other class, which is our binary tree. Binary tree class, we decided is going to have a root node, private node root. We will then have a constructor, public binary tree, and we'll say this dot root is equal to null. All right, and then we can do a, um, uh, we're going to do a display, two display methods, one for in order, one for post order. Okay. So we'll start with our in order display. So public void display in order. And this guy will ask the question if this dot root is equal to null, then what are we gonna do? We're gonna do a system.out.println empty tree. And we'll go ahead and write the second part of this. I bet you can't believe we can't guess what your homework's going to be. Display post order. Empty tree. And maybe we put a little statement here. System.out.println in order. post order. All right. So those are our couple of display methods. Now we can go out to driver and we can go ahead and create a binary tree. We'll call display in order, display post order, and we should get both empty trees, but with our descriptors in order and post order. All right. Now, we'd like to be able to add stuff to our binary tree, right? We're not going to deal with removing stuff yet, but we want to be able to add stuff. So let's go back here to our binary tree. Besides having a root node, we have our display in order, display, post order, 
and then we want to have at. Adding a node to a tree always does that trickle effect that we looked at here. It looks at the current node and it decides should it go before or go after this guy. It will never replace it. Make sense? It's always going to go to the left or go to the right. So we'll go into our binary tree. We're going to have our public void add. This guy will take in an integer value as a parameter. And then what we're going to do is we're going to ask ourselves, is this value less than or equal to my value? Or is it greater? My value is my root node, correct? What we're going to do is we're going to teach nodes how to add values. So I'm going to go into node, and node is also going to have a method, add value. Okay, or maybe we call it add node, just to differentiate between them. We'll call them add node here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and build the node inside of binary tree. We'll build it here. Thanks. Thank so here at add, we're going to say node. The node is equal to new node facet value. So we'll go ahead and build that brand new node there, which calls our node constructor right here that does this, sets the payload and nullifies the left and right node. Then I need to go ahead and tell my root node this dot root dot add node. The node. So I need to go and write add node here. I need to teach a node how to add a node to itself. And how do we do that? If I'm a node and somebody told me to add a new node, I'm going to look at it and say, should this go to my left or should this go to my right? Correct? If it's less than or equal to my payload, it's going to go to my left. If it's greater than my payload, it's going to go to the right. Make sense? So we'll go into node. We'll say public void add node. This guy's going to take a node n as a parameter. If n dot get payload is less than or equal to this dot payload. So if the current node that I'm trying to add should go to my left, then I'm going to try to add it to my left. If this dot left node is equal to null. If I don't already have an, a, a left node, then I'll just say this dot left node is equal to n. Else, I need to say this dot left node dot add node n. I need to tell my left node to go ahead and add it to himself. And then he's going to go through this whole process again. It's almost like recursion. But we're actually calling a different nodes add node. So this question says, if the node I'm trying to add should go to my left, that is, its value is less than or equal to my value, then I will check my left node. If I don't have a left node, I'll just go ahead and make him my left node. But if I do have a left node, then I'm going to ask my left node to add this node. And that trickle effect will happen. Else, if it should go to my right, I'll ask a pretty similar Oh, I'll just write it again. If this dot right node is equal to null, then I'll just say this dot right node is equal to n. Else, this dot right node dot add node n. That makes sense? So that's our add node.
Pretty simple. Follows what we did here in our picture, right? If I'm going to add a 2 to this tree, we start off trying to, we create the new node in, in binary tree, and then we try to add it to our root node. Our root node says, should a 2 come before me, or should a 2 come after me? Is 2 less than or equal to 3, or is it greater than 3? It's less than or equal to. So then this node looks at his left node. Does he have a left node? He does. So since he has a left node, we're just going to go ahead and take this node right here and pass it to my left node and tell him to add it. Then we ask the same question again. Should a 2 come before a 1 or after a 1? Should come after. Okay, so that means we're going to put it as my right node. Do I already have a right node? I do. So I'm going to tell my right node to add this guy. Should a 2 come before a 2 or after a 2? Is it less than or equal to 2 or is it greater than 2? Less than or equal to. So I'll say, does this guy have a left node? He doesn't. So I'll just set this guy to be the left node. And I'm done. Make sense how that code works? Okay. You're not supposed to be able to write it that fast, but I only had a couple minutes before class was over. All right, so now for your homework, and we'll just assume this works. We'll find out if it works uh, when you um, uh, write your display in order and display post order uh, uh, methods. But for your homework, you're going to write display in order and display post order, uh, which should do something very similar to what we did uh, right here. In order of this tree would do, well, before I added the two, let's just get the two out of there, would show a three, one, two, five, seven. It visits the node first, then the left child. The node first, then the left child, then the right child, then the right child. Make sense? Post order. It's kind of misleading, but it's called <laughs> in order, but it's out of order. Uh, in order basically says we visit the node first. Post order says we visit the node in the middle after we visited the left node. So post visiting the left node. Make sense? So for your homework, you're going to finish writing the display in order, display post order, and fix my code if anything's wrong. I'm pretty certain it's right. So um, I rarely make mistakes, as we all know. So uh, you should be able to add stuff to your tree, and I can actually just go ahead and sample, add, add some things. Just real quick. So I'll say bt dot add to five seven one zero three. Let's say one last thing we need to do to make this complete is inside of our binary tree when we do add. Before we just tell it to add to our root node, we have to ask if this dot root is equal to null, then this dot root is equal to the node. Else, tell our root node to add it. Otherwise, it wouldn't have worked for the empty tree. So if our tree was empty, the node we just added just becomes the new root node. Done. Otherwise, do the trickle effect thing. Make sense? So if I run this right now, it'll run. No errors, but in order and post order don't have things in it. So you notice it doesn't say empty tree. It thinks there's crap there, but you haven't written the rest of those methods. Got it? All right. I'll see everybody on Thursday. Remember Bible study today. If you're interested, we're going to go to the cafeteria, sign in, get free lunch. Then we go down to the, whatever, Luptec Terrace Room to uh, listen to uh, Bible study. And I'll put this up on uh, GitHub.